Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules today. Um, we're here to talk about Rai's work and this amazing new project that he's done in collaboration with Absolute, which is perhaps, probably the most ambitious single project that you've ever embarked on. Um, and uh, follows on several years of work. You graduated in 2006 from USC, uh, is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, so all of what Jonathan has just said is true. This probably is the most ambitious in scale, um, both in production and in square footage. Uh, I graduated from USC in the year 2006 and have been working professionally as an artist uh, since then. Um, I should say, you know, even though I've got this um, funny British accent, I live in Los Angeles now and I've been there since 2010. The first time I came across Rise work was in that year where uh, at the show um, Country Music uh, at Blum and Poe. Um, and it was a group show. Uh, I, I saw hanging on the outside of this of the building this uh, circular disc um, hanging on a rope that stretched all the way around the upper part of the building, and uh, discovered that this was a piece called Giant Health Medallion. The gallery liked it so much that they kept it up for a year maybe longer, um, and it became part of the architecture. And it was my introduction to uh, Rai's practice, um, perhaps not like a representative work necessarily, but something kind of interesting there about um, enchantment and uh, elevation, uh, casting a spell um, over a space and um, a much more spatial work than many of his subsequent things that I've seen, which are more uh, discrete objects, um, sculptures that are typically um, objects that Rai finds, uh, used, discarded things like rugs and mattresses, which he, he kind of resuscitates or elevates um, by covering them with mosaic tiles or uh, plating them with nickel plates. Um, but I'm, I'm saying this is a real uh, brief overview as to what Rai does for anyone who's not familiar with it already. But what I think we should do is look at some images of the work that we're talking about. Um, they're scrolling along behind me. Um, perhaps, Rai, you could talk us through like where this project uh, came from. This image that we're looking at now is uh, from 2011, right? Yeah, this is a sculpture called Second to None. And uh, if you guys have been to the bar yet, it's an uh, absolute art bar uh, along with myself and my new line of furniture, Trophy Modern. And so this sculpture here is uh, a sculpture I made with over 150 found trophies. And so I saw these trophies at a thrift store and decided they'd make a great material for a sculpture. And I was interested in the, the pathos and the... Uh, of the discarded trophy and what happens to the trophy when it's detached from its, uh, f the person who, I, who it was awarded to. And so I bought these trophies and then um, in putting together this sculpture I had to buy a bunch of trophy parts from, the supplies, uh, from a trophy supply catalog. And it was through my relationship with this trophy supply catalog that I realized you could make anything out of trophy parts which is what ended up um, becoming uh, my new uh, furniture company, Trophy Modern. Perhaps, uh, you know, interesting thing to say at this point is that, um, is it possible to scroll back a picture um, or two? Yeah, here, okay, so you see on the floor around the sculpture, um, there's these checkered tiles, which uh, it's hard to see in this picture, but they're actually, um, there we go, better picture. They're actually f uh, found paintings um, that Rye picked up in thrift stores and uh, covered uh, with a grid of kind of non-slip paint, reinforced them so that you could walk on them. Um, and like a lot of Rye's work, uh, there's this element of, of um, him modifying an object which is 
previously been made by somebody else. Uh, not necessarily an artwork, but a, a kind of vernacular, um, handmade uh, thing. Uh, in this case, an artwork. But in the trophies, bef I guess when you first found the trophies, what's kind of interesting is that they are, in a sense, a kind of contemporary craft object. You know, like these things are... We can see like there's certain um, conventions, uh, there's certain aesthetics that they conform to, um, and uh, they um, the materials come from uh, very limited kind of sources. There's perhaps like two major companies that um, produce these. So in terms of authorship, uh, you know, at this time, Rise making work which. Um, is in a sense a kind of collaboration. I don't know if you ever thought of it in that term, in those terms. Yeah, well, the the show that the sculpture Second to None was in was an exhibition I had in New York uh, called Believe You Me. And I was interested with that show in particular at uh, the relationship the work had to um, the many people that had somehow were implicated in the work itself. So one of the pieces in that show was a, was a plated phone book I found lying by the side of the road. And um, that phone book was kind of uh, placed at the be entrance of the show. And then you'd walk in and you'd see all these paintings. You'd be walking on the found paintings and then you'd end up in the back at this second to none sculpture with all these trophies from Los Angelinos who somehow had given them up. So I, I thought, uh, I had this idea that it was, there were probably the names of the artists who made the paintings and both won the trophies in the phone book. And... Um, but, but still at this point, these were like artworks by Rye Rocklin. And then you made this kind of very important turn around the corner uh, towards producing objects which were... Uh, credited to Trophy Modern, uh, or at least, I guess, you know, this is a project which is still in formation, but, but you know, like, you, Trophy Modern is a, is a company uh, that Rai set up, a brand. Uh, so, in a way, uh, Rai Rocklin is taking a back seat to uh, this, uh, this, this, this new brand. Perhaps you could talk a bit about, like, why you had this impulse to, to, to hide yourself or bury your identity as an author beneath the um, brand? Well, I think to some degree, I, there's a bit of ridiculousness to this project. Uh, More than a bit. Uh, for, yeah, furniture made out of trophy parts. Um, it was an idea that was uh, born almost out of a joke, like um, uh, that I told to a friend, and then I ended up pursuing and actually creating. and And so when we when we set out on on when I set out on making this furniture, you see, I call it furniture. It is furniture, um, and I and I really wanted people to be comfortable with it as furniture and that they would be able to sit on it and put their feet up on it. Um, and so in some ways, I think just that moniker of it being called Trophy Modern and it being a furniture company um, reinforces the fact that it is f a furniture line. Um, but also, I guess I'm, in, I'm interested in the, the whole mechanics of a brand and um, how, how the kind of um, iconography or the kind of the visuals that, are, that surround a brand. And so with this furniture, um, I like the idea that it was similar to something you could get at Ikea. So I want to eventually do a limited edition, an edition of one of our ch simple chairs, the American Diner, that you'd buy in a cardboard box and then you'd assemble yourself. Um, it's interesting you, you dealing with this uh, idea of branding at a, a kind of intersection of two, uh, I guess, forces. Like on the one hand, we have this um, uh, drinks manufacturer um, 
that is incredibly supportive of uh, visual artists and quite smart in that it is not, um, as you see in Rise Bar, not over-branding the project uh, itself. They're allowing artists to retain their own identity and not become like, you know, absolute artists. And then on the other hand, we have, um, you can see out here, you know, like uh, branding is so much a part of contemporary art production today uh, that what we have in this structure is, is kind of brand management uh, on behalf or by artists themselves. And, you know, I wonder, like, how you feel about these kind of developments where companies are perhaps being far more uh, smart and subtle about branding than uh, so supposedly smart and subtle contemporary artists. Yeah, well, I, th I think um, there's, a f there's a great kind of reverse uh, osmosis going on there. Like you said, I mean, um, uh, I guess, you know, it's, it's uh, I guess it's all in the name of trying to sell stuff. On uh, everyone's uh, part. Uh, either way, yeah, no, whatever it takes, that's still the end goal. So I suppose um, people get bored. Well, I mean, there's two models. Like, I always think of um, uh, Nauman, right? Uh, what, Bruce... Bruce, Bruce Nauman. See, I am terrible with names and then the most obvious artist. But yeah, I think about Bruce Nauman as being this, this artist who um, goes about kind of setting a flag on an island and claiming it as his, like the classic uh, cast space underneath his arm or from underneath the chair and then that be somehow Rach like Rachel White Reed was doing a Bruce Nauman by casting the inside of, so there was like this kind of claiming of, of one territory to the next that went on with um, artists of that generation. And now I think there is a more prevalence of branding. Like I feel there are artists that I really like. Currently I like their work, but they almost have maybe three or four pieces that they do. And then that piece is kind of repeated over and over again from one art fair to the next. And I think that's absolutely a condition of the art fair as well, like a recognizable branded item in the context of a, of a clusterfuck of a And a kind of variation on the theme as well, which is something that you've used with these works you know you set uh, parameters and I know that what you partly what you've really enjoyed is is playing with how you can like reinvent these objects within certain rules that you've set for yourself uh, I mean I know there's you know there's a number of different uh, sub lines planned of uh, trophy modern Oh, yeah. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for segueing into... I feel like uh, I'm selling this <laughs> yeah. furniture for him. I mean, it's more... F yeah, th it's funny. It's, it's, it's fun, in a way, to go down this branding line. It, it, I keep saying, and I was, I've been talking with people about the project, and I say Trophy Modern makes furniture, but the enterprise is the art. I'm not sure exactly what that means yet, but it to me there's like this kind of creative potential or this this um, like this idea of a of a brand and and what you can do with a brand that can produce and um, create uh, new new work within that brand. So, for example, Trophy Modern. Um, I have this idea. I would love to open up a Trophy Modern furniture store probably in Los Angeles. And at, a, at the shop, we we're going to have, we're going to sell a number of Trophy Modern lines. So we have our Trophy Modern standard line, which is what we have on display at the um, night court with Absolute. And that's with the classic plastic columns and the um, faux marble uh, boards. Then we'd have our Trophy Modern wood line, which would be slightly more luxurious uh, for uh, it would be made using wood columns and then beautifully finished wood panels and, uh, of course, uh, leather cushions. And then we'd have uh, Trophy Modern Noir, which would be our all-black Trophy Modern. 
and then we'd have Trophy Ultra Modern, which would be like I don't know if you guys are familiar with the way trophies are made, but they're basically like a shish kebab with a threaded rod going through the center, and the, there's a nut and a bolt on either side that holds everything together. So that's how these are made. There's threaded rods going through the center of all those columns. So I want to do a Trophy Ultra Modern line, which would be using real marble and chrome-plated threaded rods, and you wouldn't have any of the plastic columns surrounding the threaded rods. So you, the, in, the interior of the uh, furniture would be exposed. Which would be the most sophisticated uh, of all Trophy Modern lines. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Exactly. You know, Rise always made sculpture or installations that deal with ideas of uh, status and uh, hierarchy. And like, even within this new work, it's immediately being kind of uh, sedimented into uh, a kind of class structure, even within Trophy Modern. I want to talk a bit about class later on, but this question I have, if anyone's read any of the, um, the kind of publicity uh, material, Rai is quoted very often saying, Trophy Modern is more than just a furniture, it's a lifestyle. And I kind of wanted to ask you what you meant by that and whether you had your tongue in your cheek at that point well uh, what i mean by well to be that's it it just rolls off the tongue a lot of this stuff just rolls off the tongue like i was saying to you earlier this project is um it kind of has a mind of its own so of course trophy modern is more than just furniture it's a lifestyle um what kind of lifestyle is that? And it's, whose? And whose? Well, for the time being, um, it's the art lover lifestyle, the fun loving, um, fun loving lifestyle. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, we, we're selling this work to mainly art collectors uh, and it, it is a bit of a luxurious lifestyle um, but at the same time the, my other tagline for Trophy Modern is uh, on Trophy Modern everyone's a winner because I like uh, this, the, the idea that even if you don't own it there's a celebratory aspect to the shimmer and the shine and the transformation of these materials and then once you are using the thing it, or once you're amongst this um, kind of uh, sensational furnishing, then it, it's, uh, it's good fun. I mean, how, how important was it for you that um, this project here uh, in Miami was publicly accessible in a way that kind of previous incarnations were not so much? Uh, it's very... I'm. Um, I mean, I've always been an advocate, and uh, I was in, it was instilled in me very early on to the kind of de democratic art making uh, process, like that somehow w I was I've always been attracted to work that um, is accessible to just about anyone, e except that this. Luxury furniture is yeah, um, 21. out the range of most people's furniture budgets. Right. Well, then we, we're working on a licensing agreement, so we can bring it. No, we're not working on it yet, but that is a possibility, I think. But out, even outside of that, for at least the time being, I think this is a public space. I mean, at least for a week, if you're over 21, you can come and enjoy the Trophy Modern lifestyle. I mean, uh, you've talked about the project as being kind of celebratory and um, uh, enjoyable uh, on, a, on a very kind of basic, almost like childlike level, these shiny uh, effects and bright colors. But, um, you know, can, where is the... How do, you, how do you identify the kind of critique in the work? And is it, as it might seem to lots of us here, uh, aimed at the purely at the people who uh, are going to buy the work, who are going to own it in their homes? Or is it a more uh, complicated 
um, conversation than that. Well, well uh, we were, yeah, we were talking about this earlier, and uh, one w one important aspect is, for me, it didn't start off ironically. Like there was something very pragmatic about the the birth of Trophy Modern in the sense that I was making the sculpture second to none, which was 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 kind of about the pathos and the in between state of a tr an award that has been given up, a kind of monument to the loss of that ownership. Uh, so that was like one place that second to none occupied. And then I had that idea to just take that system of trophies and trophy parts and trophy construction to make furniture. And then it, I think in that sense, there is there is a sincere, like, like the, the aesthetics of it, I think, are quite, uh fun i mean i don't either you could say it uh, like it's also quite it's super ugly right um but but in the same way it's like it's like a sunday with like we were saying a, like a sunday with every imaginable topping that's not going to equal a, a good go combination um but but it's still kind of a fun impulse to have Shiny and rainbow and and is that impulse gold. A, a a force for good uh, in your mind or, or a uh, force for evil? Evil is a know strong word. This a problematic. Um, well, I I suppose one thing I think that's a force of good, and this is probably true with any successful work of art, is to get get someone to be able to see something in a different way, like uh, I think probably if you're able to ch have a change of perspective, there's some kind of calories that are burned in your in your brain. I mean, like lit, you know that this is actually a, uh, to expand one's mind. I think in general is like a good thing. So for the trophies, you see this recognizable material, and then it becomes a piece of furniture, there's that trans transform transformation that happens and I you know, I think that's a positive thing to experience. But as for yeah, the the impulse of like it's shiny and I want it to reaffirm that um part of the brain I think is I mean you're baiting me because yeah, that's not like when you go to the to the restaurant, you never want to order a burger, and it always takes like it's hard not to sometimes. But um, so is Trophy Modern a a burger or a kale salad or somewhere in between? Probably macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, you you know we were we were talking earlier about the um. Uh, the will of the objects themselves, you know, the will of the, of the object to be something uh, uh, greater than it is or, or more valuable than it is. Um, you know, this stuff is made really cheaply and even, you know, it's not even metal plated, it's kind of gold paint on, on plastic, much of it. Um, do, you, do you see, and, and this is something that, that uh, runs through a lot of Rise work, not just the Trophy Modern uh, project, do you see like your work as being kind of pretentious this i mean and i mean this word in a kind of non-judgmental way and i'm not talking about rye as an artist but that these things are, are have kind of almost like objects that have class aspiration of their own or objects that want to be something that they're not that dream um are they aspirational yeah. totally i mean i guess uh, yeah and that, is that is that an okay thing for you? Well, um, I mean, I guess that's the American dream. I think a lot of this work is ki kind of quite um, American, um, both in its materiality and its 
philosophy. And, and not just American, but specifically kind of West Coast and even specifically Southern Californian. You know, Rye was born in Los Angeles and, and still lives there. There's very few people uh, I meet there who, you know, have, have been in the city the whole way through. But I, I guess, you know, with a lot of the works that I make, it's, it's, a found, it's something I find, like an old mattress, and then it gets um, bedazzled in a way, like it's, it's plated or it's tiled. And uh, in that process, there's this, tr there's this kind of devotion to the object. There's like a, an investment in the object, either literally with the, with the plating or... or you know that it is there's in a kind of equivalency with with money like with some kind of money that goes into the thing to make it shiny or there's a, a an investment in energy and time with something like the tile and the, um i think there's in that sense there is a the the work the object that's been attended to becomes um, is given some kind of potency because there's somebody who believes in it, which is me as the artist, and I guess that's like uh, I mean that's that's the quintessential aspect of aspiration is believing that you can be be somewhere you're not currently and get find a figure out a way. To get yourself there, or and, and and there's also something about uh, uh, resisting entropy. You know, like the, your time invested in these objects uh, uh, makes them more more permanent in in our world, whether that's just uh, materially or uh, in terms of their their value. Um, I find that quite profound aspect uh, when we're, we're thinking about um, about what these things mean. One thing I, I haven't even asked you uh, uh, in all the time I've known you, but like, are you were you into sports as a as a kid? Are you still into sports? Um, I, you know what? As I've gotten older, I've been be, become increasingly into sports, and I'm not. I think, but as a kid, I was most into the idea of winning a trophy, which is probably like the aspect that's embedded in all of this whole mania of, of Trophy Modern, some kind of childhood fantasy being played out. But I, I, I think, um, I mean, for me, there's something very comforting about sports. It's a kind of universal language. There's a, a potential for perfection that happens within this very rigid um, set of rules. There's the symmetry, great symmetry, like the appeal of symmetry um, of whatever court is being played on, the spectacle of the arena. Do you, do you believe in this kind of system of um, achievement and, and kind of gradating value? Um, I mean, personally, I could never subscribe to sports because I didn't really care who won. I didn't believe that, like, they had much to be happy about if they were better than that other person on the day. You know, like, I hated those people. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's, there's, well, it's funny. I, w I mean, I was talking about this earlier and I realized, like, I, I like sports, but I, and I guess I'm a fan of sports, but when it comes, I'm a fan of the perfect tie. Like, I always want the game, whatever game it is, to go on and on and both players to play, like, equally well. So even, like, I'm from L.A., so I like, I'm a Lakers fan. And inevitably, I'm watching the Lakers and they'll have a big lead, even in, a, in like, the most important game of the season, maybe the final game. I will invariably root for the other team in order for them to like make a comeback just so they can win by the skin of their teeth and um so in that way i guess i'm a fan of the game i think that's really revealing about the uh, relationship between these kind of paradoxical uh, aspects to your work that you want it ultimately to be a tie i was going to ask you this question like 
is there space for losers in your work? In Trophy Modern, I should say. Um, well, it just reminds me of a, of a joke I came up with many years ago. And that is, uh, it, in, in what land are there no winners or no losers? Tell me. Uh, Thailand. So, I mean... Ladies and it, gentlemen, Roy <laughs> Rockman. Um, uh, but, but yeah, are there, is there room for losers? I mean, I, the idea is hopefully, I, you know, I don't want people, I, I ha I'm a very empathetic person, so in a way, if somebody feels like a loser, I'm going to want them, like, just as a, yeah, like I said, as a, someone who wants people to be happy around me, I would hope they weren't. I mean, there's a two things going on. There's one is who can buy them and then who can sit on them, right? Like, and so there's this reality of like uh, the fact that it costs me a bunch of money to make them and, and invest my time in them. Uh, so, so only so many people can buy them so I can sustain that process. But at the same time, I am much more interested in like one of the most exciting cards I was given this 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 triumphant week here at in Miami was uh, a card from the uh, U.S. Ambassadors Department uh, and their collections team. So that to me, like whatever, I'm gonna they're you know they're gonna have to pay some some decent money to to acquire these works, but it would be ideal to have them shown in some kind of U.S. embassy or, or in a place where they can be enjoyed by the public sphere. Like that is, like the aspiration of Trophy Modern is in lobbies, is in embassies, it's in places in which people like, in a, yeah, in places that are, are like semi-public sitting rooms. Well, it's, uh really great that you kind of achieved that this week uh, in these kind of unique circumstances. Yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been great working with Absolute and, and being able to, to do this massive project and to have it be open to the Miami residents as well as the art. Um, does anyone have any questions? We kind of uh, running out of time. There's, um, a microphone, if you could just wait until um, a colleague comes over. We're more than thrilled it, to have Rice Peace at LACMA in Los Angeles. We are in the acquisitions board, and we are two of the collectors that went first time to a studio. And then what we were going to see in those lockers and trophies and all kinds of weird stuff, but it was cool. And we liked it. And we just connected with him, and we, we got to know him better. And then he was, he, we didn't see the big one. We saw a picture of it. And we said, that's it. And unanimously, when we voted for the board to vote, we wanted that trophy. And it's sitting in El Flat, in B Camp, on the third floor. Yeah, that's something I didn't mention. It's, it's a fantastic stroke of coincidence that it's just been. Uh, no, it's a black one. It's a the, the question is for Rai. So what is next? Are we going to become uh, furniture makers? <laughs> oh, you know, I think we're going to take a slight break from the Trophy Modern Universe. And um, I mean, I, I still have uh, sculptures that I'm interested in making that you can't sit on. So those, I have a show in Paris with a gallery, Pras de la Valade, that's opening in February. And, um, I think the through line, at least from this work into that show, is I'm continuing to work with found objects and I, I kind of am focusing in on, on objects related to an American middle class. And so I have an easy chair, one of those classic easy chair recliners and um, this decrepit faux finished wall and it just I, so 
these will become some of the works in that show. Um, so thank you. And thank you, yeah, that LACMA thing is huge. This piece being at LACMA um, was a real thrill and um, a crowning achievement. Um, and I think, it, you know, as you're saying, it's really important that it's a, a, a publicly accessible space. You know, the, 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 the piece goes to the people of the city. Um. It's true. And I think LACMA is an institution that has a great history with, make, with, with acquiring and showcasing work that is accessible to the public. I mean, they have, like, Chris Burden's Works, the urban which, light. But it, we're, oh, huh. you're talking about the metropolis. Yeah, metropolis. Um, I mean, and Sarah's massive ins installation, and they have like quite a few spectacular, easy to get works. It's funny. Uh, I don't know how many people here um, are familiar with the urban lights uh, installation that Chris Burden did outside LACMA, but it's a strange kind of parallel that didn't strike me until now. These kind of vernacular found objects, even formally, it's kind of um, it's along some lines. It, it's, Were you even thinking about that when you made it? it a little. I mean. No, I'm, there's, there's aspects that I can see that, that are completely shared. I mean, formally, if you guys have ever seen that work, it's just these light posts, and they're all kind of assembled in a similar manner with the tall ones in the center. So there's a definite formal relationship. But there's also, to me, this, th there's a slight, like, and there's something slightly arbitrary about both the sculptures that I can see, which is like, where does Chris stop collecting those lamps? Like, when is it enough? Like, oh, this is enough lamps now to do a piece. But it's not like, but there could be more. And maybe with this work, there's something similar where there could be more. But I guess, um, I think this one functions as a whole like, I think maybe that happens a little less because this is one massive trophy that is made of many trophies, whereas Chris's work kind of doesn't have that boundary built into it because it, they are discrete lamp posts that could... How did you know when to stop collecting trophies? Um when the deadline was, was, <laughs> was close. I mean, to be honest, I bought almost all the trophies for this sculpture in one go. So in that sense, it wasn't so much, a, it was a collection that was like, the thrift store said to me, here's 150 trophies for you. Um, this, you know, do a work with them. Like it was almost a set amount and then which was just a massive amount. Uh, so, yeah. We've got another. Can you wait for the microphone? Yeah, this is going to. Uh, this isn't so much a question, but just to add to the, um, about the Chris Burden light piece, I heard he bought that whole collection from, uh, um, from one collector. Oh, That's my God. Oh, I've, uh, really? Is that true? I uh, maybe add uh, now. I've just made that up. <laughs> he bought them at a thrift well, store if, if as that well. Is, if but that is true, I think he was collecting them before that as well. Yeah, he'd yeah. begun to collect them. Yeah, but I. But I, I, you. I. Um, but I did have a question about um, like because uh, that um, second to none was like very specifically made for like a definite like art gallery context. Um, and then, uh, and there is like a lot of like, you know, variation in like the different statues and the different, the different types of the, the columns used and the colors. And then with, um, some of these, uh, like, uh, the trophy modern furniture, like when you go into the trophy modern, you have like these like repeating patterns and like, you go like from red to blue and you know, there's four, like the chair, the furniture kind of dictates a structure. So I was wondering, like, w um, 
your mindset going into like making the the second to none versus making for a gallery or for like a, a traditional art context versus making something for uh, to to be used as furniture or if they're yeah, that's a good question yeah I, I um with second to none the aesthetics were much more uh, were were much weren't weren't really on the front page of my thought process it was like just trying to figure out the size of them and which ones we could put on the same plane and how to get all of them together unified as this one work and so there was no patterning or it was just this hodgepodge of color that was determined by this the, the trophies I bought at the thrift store but then with the furniture it, it was um, you know, me having total control over what colors I was buying because it was from the catalog. And, um, and me also trying uh, to, to, um, to take, to somehow like give, be somewhat discerning about the design of the, the trophy, of the furniture and not have it be just like totally absolutely ugly like just relatively ugly maybe like try to get the color schemes as as chic as i could get them within that world relatively ugly not absolutely ugly yeah it's a, it's a fair ambition for a project <laughs> um i think we're running out of time um but thank you so much everyone for for taking the time out and i hope you get to spend time in actual artwork um uh, it has uh, more alcoholic beverages than any artwork I've encountered this week, which is a bonus. And yeah, please join us uh, tonight. There's two last performances. My rap band, uh, or our rap band, The Bushes, is playing. I keep saying that, but it's uh, with Nick Lowe and myself and uh, internet rap sensation Young Jake. And it's quite fitting. The focus of the next talk is branding. So obviously, we're not stick the only one. for that. Thank you yeah, very much, thank everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>